I bought the Canon 70-200 f2.8 almost three years ago, and it has been one of only two lenses that I've had in my kit and used for every single project, paid or for fun, for the past three years. The other lens being my 24-70. And although my 24-70 sees way more use than my 70-200, I think this might be my favorite lens I've ever owned. And with news of Canon releasing the Mark II version of this lens soon, I wanted to talk about why I like this lens so much and if you should consider buying it and kind of go over the ups and downs of it. So first, let's get started with some specs. As it says in the name, the RF 70-200 f2.8 L lens covers the 70-200 millimeter range and has a minimum aperture of f2.8. This is really important because Canon also has an f4 version of this lens for a cheaper price. And when comparing the two, it's easy to look at that number and see how it's kind of a small difference and go with the f4 version because you save some money and it's just f2.8 to f4, right? It's not that big of a deal. But having this lens be an f2.8 is actually pretty great. And I'll get into that in a bit. This lens also has optical image stabilization built in with up to five stops of shake correction. Now, a lot of people, when they think of image stabilization, they think of the shakiness getting removed in video and being able to shoot handheld video. And while that is the case, the whole reason image stabilization exists in the first place is to actually correct for shaky hands when shooting photos. Now, a good rule of thumb when you're shooting with a lens is to shoot with at least whatever shutter speed the lens focal length is equivalent to. And this is because the more zoomed in you are, the more any handshake that you have will be translated into the photos. And if your shutter speed is too low, you can end up with blurry photos because your hands are shaking a little bit. But with this image stabilization built into the lens, you can actually shoot at a lower shutter speed than you otherwise would be able to, which makes this lens even better in low light scenarios. This lens also has a minimum focal distance of 0.7 meters or 2.5 meters. It's adjustable and we'll get into why that's important. Like all the other RF lenses, it also has a control ring, which I don't find super useful. Your mileage may vary, but you can set this ring to control one of pretty much any of your camera settings. And being an L lens, it's also weather sealed, which is really nice. So let's go over some of the things that I really like about this lens and why it's one of my favorites. Unlike previous Canon 70-200 lenses, this lens has an external telescoping zoom, which means when you go from 70 millimeters to 200 millimeters, the lens actually extends out from the main body of it, as opposed to previous 70-200 lenses where the zooming was internal and the lens didn't get any longer. Now, depending on what you're doing, this isn't exactly a good thing or a bad thing. It entirely depends on what you need. As someone who does a lot of on-the-go photos and videos, I really appreciate it because it means that when it's down to 70 millimeters, it fits in my bag really nicely. In my Low Pro 450, whatever it's called, backpack, I can actually pack this lens standing straight up and down because it's so short at 70 millimeters. There is no other 70 to 200 lens you can do this with. That being said, this does come with a trade off, but I'll get into that. The other thing I really like about this lens is the switch that allows you to limit the minimum focal distance. You can change your minimum focal distance from the built in 0.7 meters to up to 2.5 meters. Now you might be asking yourself, why on earth would I not want my lens to? focus closer. Well, it has to do with autofocus speeds. Because this is such a long lens, when you're zooming between things that are close up and far away, the zoom motors have to move quite a bit to shift that focus. And this can lead to the focus hunting, looking for the thing to focus on for a long period of time, and that can lead you to missing your shot. So if you're shooting something that you know is going to be two and a half meters away from you or further, flipping that switch means the lens won't even be trying to focus at anything closer than 2.5 meters, limiting the range it can focus on, meaning it'll most likely hit your focus faster. If you've used a telephoto lens like this before, under the image stabilization switch, you might have noticed the image stabilization mode switch. This lens has three modes, one, two, and three labeled on the lens. And a lot of people actually have no idea what this does, and that's fair because it's not applicable to most people. Essentially, it allows you to choose what planes are going to be stabilized. When you have it set to mode one, you're stabilizing every movement, up and down and side to side. But this isn't always ideal, especially if you're doing panning shots. Motorsport photography is a good example of this, where you're panning side to side, and especially if you're locked down on a tripod, you know your camera is not going to be going up and down. So why would your lens need to try and stabilize for that up and down movement? If you have it set to mode one where it's stabilizing both axes, then this can lead to the lens trying to stabilize that up and down movement and actually adding in more unnecessary movement than you want. This is a feature that not everyone is going to need and I actually don't use it that often, but I do think it is really cool to have that option. Another thing I really like about this lens is the tripod mount that's built into it, but can also be removed. This ring is really secure when attached to the lens, but easily disconnects and is really Really important for tripod mounting, especially when you're talking about a heavier lens like this. Because compared to the camera, the lens is so heavy, if you mount the camera on the tripod with the normal tripod mounting screw on the camera body, you end up with a really front heavy setup that can 
put too much weight and start to tilt the lens down. However, if you mount it from the mount on the lens, it's going to be a lot more center balanced. And this is just going to overall be a lot better for tripods. And also if you want to try and gimbal mount this, which by the way, you can. And the last thing that I really like about this lens is that it looks professional. And I know that sounds silly, but when you're talking about going out on professional gigs and getting paid for your work, how you show up, how you present yourself and what your equipment looks like does matter to the client. I often get comments on this lens when I show up to shoots with it. People go, oh wow, that lens means business. Wow, that's that's such a big lens. And this is by far not the most important thing about your camera gear, but it is something to know. All right, now for the things I don't like about this lens. Number one, it is heavy. Now, if you've ever held one of these Canon mirrorless bodies, you know they are insanely light, but this is unfortunately kind of overshadowed by how heavy the lenses are. This goes for most RF lenses, but especially once you get into the telephoto range, you really notice it. Now, to be fair, as of the release date of this lens, it is the lightest 70 to 200 that Canon makes. And overall for a telephoto zoom, it's not bad, but it is worth noting that this is heavy. This is something I've noticed particularly when I'm walking around Toronto or I go on a hike. I like to use my Peak Design clip so that I can strap my camera to my shoulder and walk around hands-free. Now, when I have the 70 to 200 on there, after a while, I actually start to feel the pull on my shoulder and I'll have days where if I go on a big hike and my camera's strapped here all day, I actually end up with a really sore left shoulder. Another downside of this lens, it is really long. This is the trade-off I was talking about earlier. Because it's so small when it's at 70 millimeters, but it telescopes out to 200 millimeters, you run into a few problems. On previous generation 70 to 200 lenses, you wouldn't have any telescoping abilities. The zoom would be entirely internal, which means the lens would be maybe about this big, but when you zoom, that wouldn't change. Now, I do really like that this lens telescopes because it fits in my bag so nicely, but look at the difference of this. This is 70 millimeters, and this is 200 millimeters. This is pretty long, and it's actually a bit bigger than if you just had the 70 to 200 that didn't telescope. Now, this is a problem for a couple reasons. One, even if you're just shooting handheld and you don't have anything attached to it, it is just a long lens. It's a little bit unwieldy, but if you try to rig up your camera to any kind of accessories, you start to run into some problems. Like I mentioned before, you can actually balance this on a gimbal. I recently just shot a concert where I balanced this on my DJI RS3 and it works just fine. But because it telescopes, I could only shoot at 70 millimeters because as soon as I zoom in, even just to 100 millimeters, you get all of this extra weight distributed further out. And when you're talking about a gimbal that has to be perfectly balanced, this becomes a problem. It could also pose a problem if you want to try and turn this into like a cinema rig and add rails and a matte box because if you have anything built around rails on the front of your system that's fixed there, you can't change the zoom because it's gonna hit the matte box. So that compact size does come with the trade-off. Now it's rumored that in the version two of this lens, they're gonna switch back to the zooming internally. I would still rather stick with this just because of how compact it is and the fact that it fits in my bag. I don't have to gimbal balance this too often and it doesn't come up too often where I need to put this on some kind of cinema rig. So that's not really a deal breaker for me, but it definitely could be for a lot of other people. The next thing that is a bit of a drawback with this lens is that it's f2.8. And I know I said before that that was actually a good thing and it is. But when I say f2.8 is a drawback, I'm referring to the comparison between this and a prime lens. Because this lens covers the range of a lot of really popular prime lengths, 85 millimeters, 100 millimeters, 135 millimeters, 200 millimeters, these are really popular focal lengths to buy in prime lenses. And again, although the jump between f2.8 and f1.2 doesn't sound like that big of a number, the difference in low light performance and bokeh that you get in the background is a huge difference. So when you buy this lens, you're sacrificing the extra quality, the extra low light performance, and the extra background separation for the fact that you can zoom throughout this range. So if you're buying this lens and you know you pretty much only wanna shoot portraits with it, for example, you're probably better off buying something like an 85 or a 135 prime because those lenses are gonna do that one thing a lot better than the zoom will. Another drawback with this lens, and this is one that actually really bugs me, is this version of the 70 to 200 is not compatible with Canon's teleconverters. Now, if you're not familiar, a teleconverter is something that you can put on your camera before putting on your lens that extends the range of your lens. So previously with the EF lenses, if you had an EF 70 to 200 F 2.8, you could buy a two times teleconverter, and now you have a 140 to 400 millimeter lens. If you like to have that extra range, this is really handy because now you don't need to bring your 70 to 200 and a 400 
400 millimeter prime, which are also huge lenses. Instead, you can pack a teleconverter and your 70 to 200, and you can get the same kind of range. For whatever reason, probably because they were trying to make this lens so compact, the rear element of the lens sticks out too far for the teleconverter to fit on here, which means your option of buying a two times teleconverter and having an automatic 400 millimeter lens is out of the question. This is again, something I think they're gonna fix on the version two of this lens. If they don't have the external telescoping thing, I think this will be a lot easier to implement. So again, that's another trade-off for the size of this lens. And again, one that doesn't affect everyone, maybe 200 millimeters is all you need, but not having that option really sucks because there are a lot of types of photography that you need more than 200 millimeters to do. So with all that in mind, here is what I use the lens for and what I think it's really good for. The first is weddings. In tandem with my 24 to 70, this gives me a perfect range for capturing an entire wedding day. The 24 to 70 is great for most of the shots I need, but having the 70 to 200 for close-up portraits and also being able to stand on the other side of the reception hall and zoom in and snipe a particular moment across the room is also really nice. This is also my go-to portrait lens. Even at f2.8, if you zoom in to 135 or 150 millimeters, you get a really nice amount of background compression and a lot of background blur just because you zoomed in that much. And although it's no prime lens, you can still get some really awesome sharp photos with this with some really nice background compression if that's what you're going for. I also use this lens for landscapes a lot, and that sounds weird, but let me explain. Most people, when they think of landscape photography, they think of really wide lenses to capture an entire landscape, and it's true that that's really good, but shooting landscapes at 200 millimeters allows for a really cool perspective of being able to punch in on a specific detail in a landscape. If you've never tried shooting landscapes at a telephoto range, I would definitely recommend it because it's it can be kind of cool. I've also used this lens for motorsport photography. Now this also ties into what I was saying earlier because there were times where Rich was shooting on his 400 millimeter and I was shooting at 200 millimeters and he was just getting that extra range that I wish I had. And this would be a great time to use a teleconverter and not have to bring a whole extra lens with me, but because it's not compatible with this lens, I couldn't do it. That being said, I still made it work and I got some cool shots. And the last thing that I've used this lens for is wildlife photography. If wildlife photography is your goal and the main thing you wanna do, I would not recommend this lens but you can use it for wildlife photography in a pinch. Because it's my most zoomed in lens, it's just what I've used when the opportunities come up, and I've still managed to get some interesting photos in wildlife with it, but it's definitely not zoomed in enough to get those details that you want. Every single wildlife photo that I've taken with this lens, I've cropped in a bunch on, but most wildlife photographers will tell you you wanna shoot at at least 400 millimeters, probably more like 800 or sometimes even 1200 millimeters. If you think the 70 to 200 is big, this is the Canon 800 millimeter F11 lens that I just bought to shoot the eclipse coming up. This is the type of lens you need if you wanna shoot something like wildlife. And this thing is massive. So should you buy this lens? It's surprisingly versatile. The F2.8 aperture is really nice, especially compared to the F4, or if you have a cheaper lens like an F5.6 or, F8 equivalent, but it's still not as good as a prime lens for specific scenarios, and it's still a pretty expensive lens. Well, I've laid out all the facts here, and ultimately, it's up to you to decide for yourself if this is a lens that seems right for you. Also, if you're watching this right when it comes out, it is good to keep in mind that sometime this year, Canon is probably going to be releasing the version two of this lens. And so if these telescoping features are something that really bother you, it might be worth it to hold out for the newer version. But if you do want to buy this lens or check out any of the other gear I use on a regular basis, I always link all of my affiliate links to all the gear I use regularly in the description if you want to check any of that out. That's all I have for you today. If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe if you want to see more cool videos like this. I have a lot of cool stuff coming up solar clips, I'm going to Vegas to shoot a bunch of content, and more. So stay tuned, thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.